Greetings and blessings to you from Global Harvest Assembly. We pray that this message will ignite a passion for Jesus Christ in your heart and encourage you to live out your faith boldly. May you encounter God's love and grace in a powerful way today. But, um, but he was saying that, you know, many nations like the Middle East, the night has come. And, and Jesus said, work while it is still day. Thank God that we still have peace in this land. But don't take it for granted how long we will have peace. Okay, and so we need to really pray for the nations. There's a global shaking, economic shaking, political shaking. Um, and here in this nation, we're well aware of the religious shaking. And um, so we can take nothing for granted. But while we can work, while we can sow seeds, plant water, we can trust God to give the increase. To give, to give us a vision. I have a vision. God has a vision for this church. Amen. You know, I'm reminded of, of many of you maybe may have heard of the dream of a famous man. Um, well, if you're American, maybe he's famous. Martin Luther King, named after Martin Luther, who was a reformer. And he had a he, he gave this, this well-known, world-famous speech about his desire for regarding civil rights. And even God has a dream for his house. The Lord is the builder of his house. And, and I'm sad to say that his house in general is not what he intended for his church. We are so far away from where he wants us to be. And we are not there yet, no way, but I believe that we know where he wants to take us and we are in the right direction. And that's the most important thing, right? It's, it's, being, it's, it's being able to have a vision of knowing what God wants. You know, we have sadly reduced church to a, a point where many people have questioned its relevance. You know, why do we need to go to church? What's church? It's just, you know, it's not relevant. It's, it's um, tradition. But that's because it's not what the Lord meant it to be. And I think when we have a picture of what God wants us to be and what, when we understand what really it is, it's a, it's a gathering of family, really. And family is generational, right? The young, the old. In fact, have I prayed? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for inhabiting our praises. We thank you for putting your words in my mouth, for giving us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. The Son, Christ, the beloved Son, the builder of your house. We thank you, Jesus, for renewing our mind, renew the spirit of our mind. We thank you for teaching us that we may never be the same, that our hearts will be transformed, Lord, to glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and, and my, my heart, I believe God's put it in there, is to help us be the house that He's making us to be. Okay, what, is our, what, what, what does God want His house to be? That every time we can, and it's not just when we come together on Sunday, it's even your own home, right? With your own family. Because the church, local church is really a family of families. He wants us to be a house that is marked by His presence. Not just in our heads, but you know that. And, how, and what marks His presence is peace. In His presence there is fullness of joy. And sometimes we have reduced life to our mental reasoning. You know, we, we, we see what a natural eye see and we are very, very intellectual, very thinking, reasoning people. And that's why Eve fell, Adam and Eve fell. Right? She just didn't obey because God said so. She justified why was fine to disobey. And so, this morning I believe the Lord wants to remind us that it is not by mind, not by power, but by His Spirit. It's not by mind, not by power, but by His Spirit. And sometimes we reduce everything to just an emotional state. You know, my, my emotions are a bit tired or weary, but you know what? The solution from the Lord is not to give you some pills, to change your hormones, to feel better, it's to release the oil of joy. To give you a garment of praise. See, sometimes we reduce physical ailments to physical solutions, but they're just temporary band-aids. The solution from the Lord deals with the root, which is, and which is what we need to be anchored in. He has an oil of joy and gladness. He says his house will be a house of rest. So before we come to that, maybe maybe next week. But this morning, I just want to uh, carry on from last Sunday. I talked about the kingdom life of God. God wants us, the Lord wants us to, to be living stones. Okay, what does a living stone look like to, 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 that make up his house? And I'm reminded of Galatians chapter 5, the need to... Well, let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. Um, it's, it's a different way of, of learning how to abide in him. 
to remain in, in, in him, to remain, remain in his work. Galatians, it's Matthew, Mark, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, and, and the letters of Paul are basically the names of the people whom he wrote to. So Galatians is the name of the church in Galatia. It's after Corinthians. Okay, chapter 5. Let's read from verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, that is also walk in the Spirit. So you see here a walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, and living in the Spirit. Which is all different ways of learning how to abide in Him. You know, there's a word that says, Christ in us is the hope of glory. But I believe that we in Christ is the glory of our hope. And so Jesus is in us by virtue of our salvation. We are born again, we believe He's in us. But not every believer is in Christ. And that's where the breakthrough comes. That's where victory comes. It's learning how to abide in Him, how to abide in His Word, how to abide in His presence. And uh, there are three keys. You know, it's, it's when you walk, live, and let, it's not yet in and out. You know, sometimes we come to the Lord like, like an emergency, an accident place, right? You don't go there until you have an accident, an emergency. Lord, help me, I need help. And then when everything's going well, you have, you're too busy for the Lord. And so we come to Him when on a needs basis, right? On a, on a needs basis, when we have no needs, we are, we are, we are occupied, we are preoccupied. We have a problem, then we pray more, we pray harder, we do, we become to everything. And the Lord wants us to walk. That's that's what life was in Eden. He would walk in the cool of the garden with Adam and Eve. That's why it's called the word, right? You can't have fellowship or walk with someone without speaking, without the spoken word. So the essence of the word is to have communion, to have fellowship, to walk with someone. And this is what defined Enoch. You know, Enoch is amazing. I love Enoch because he's in the, mentioned in, the, in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. And the amazing thing about Enoch is he was one of God's heroes simply because he walked with God. Didn't say anything else that he did. He doesn't give us one other job that Enoch did well. Just he walked with God. And that's really the foundation. And I believe that's what Jesus did for the first 30 years of his life on earth. He just walked with the Father. Faithful in the natural things. Faithful in the ministry of helps. Not one miracle, not one supernatural act that's written down. And so I believe that's one of the reasons why the father said at his baptism, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Because Jesus didn't get frustrated or impatient. He said, God, I'm, I'm in my 20s now. Surely you can trust me to get out there and heal the sick and raise the dead. I mean, you sent me here for that purpose, right? Lord, you sent me to destroy the works of the enemy. You sent me here to give life. So why are you controlling me in the house of Joseph? Because see, Jesus did not live or serve as a servant, but he lived and served as a son. See, servants are driven by needs and opinions of men. Sons are led by the Father. Servants are driven by the expectations of people. Sons are led by the Father. And so thank God that Jesus didn't halfway, you know, when he turned 21, right? I'm going to look for another house, not enough ministry opportunities here. He was faithful. Jesus learned how to walk with God. Walk with the Father. You know, and so sometimes we kind of elevate you know, all the wonderful gifts of the Spirit, the evangelists, the, the public ministries. But we cannot look down or despise or not value your everyday walk. Your walk as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a mom, as a son and daughter, as a brother and sister, as an employee. That's no less powerful a walk than the evangelists reaching the multitudes. Our daily walk. Does it testify of Jesus? The Father is well pleased. I, I heard an amazing story of how um, the monarch butterfly migrates from Mexico to Canada over four generations. Can you believe that? It takes four generations of monarch butterflies to, to reach from Mexico to Canada. You know, the Word of God tells us that the plants of his heart are from generation to generation. Now remember, these are butterflies, not birds. Not known for speed. <laughs> Can you imagine? Flutter, flutter, flutter. So I finally make, finish the cough, die, lay eggs, die, and the next generation takes over. You see, it's not about speed, it's about faithfulness. God will never say, well done, good and famous. Well done, good and faithful. 
to whatever he's called you to do. Don't despise the days of the small beginning. Don't despise how well you do, whatever you're doing, how natural it is. And so I'm going to just share three, three keys this morning to help us abide in Him, to help us walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, live in the Spirit. And there are three things that the Word of God tells us to do as often as possible, to do all the time. Not now and then, not only when we have problems, or not only when we have needs, but all the time. You know, man, and, and all of us have heard of the one thing, right? If I tell you, if I ask you this question, what does the Bible say? What does God want us to do without ceasing? If I use that phrase, without ceasing, I'm sure all of you will say, pray, Pastor, we have to pray without ceasing. But you know, that's only one out of three things that we are told to do all the time. I don't know why we highlight prayer over the other two. But prayer is not the only thing we are told to do without ceasing. Guess what? The first, in fact, prayer is number two in the list. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17 and 18, prayer is number 17, verse 17. Not, yeah, but guess what? Before pray without ceasing, it's written in verse 16. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. And then pray without ceasing. So it's not one without the other. In fact, prayer has to come out of a heart, the spirit of thankfulness and praise. Because that determines whether we pray in unbelief and fear or whether we pray with faith and hope. So the first thing is we need to praise. This place shall continually be in our mouths. So we sang that this morning. Pray. And then thirdly, which is actually the foundation, so not technique number three, but this word shall not depart from your mouth. So the anchor of our thanksgiving and our prayer is the word. So we are told to rejoice always, that this place continually be in your mouth. We are told to pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. And the anchor of all that is, do not let this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Joshua 1 8. Over and over. John, the revelation John had of Jesus was the sword in his mouth. My son, you're going to briefly look at these three things. You know, sometimes we think, and this is where I, I probably, uh, I love to think out of the box. I hate religion, I hate tradition. I want to come back to the tree of life. You know, these, these are the things we've got to remember. In everything in life, there are two trees, like in the Garden of Eden. If the tree of life, you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's so easy to be distracted by the knowledge of good without realizing there's no life in that tree, despite how good the knowledge is. And so there are a lot of things that are good, they're not evil, they're not bad, but there's no life in it. And God wants us to eat of the tree of life. And so and it's so easy, we want, our, our human nature wants to put things in a, in, in a formula, in a method, in a technique. And, and I love this testimony that used to share, he said, someone wanted, asked him, uh, what is the technique for healing? And you know what his reply was? You have to get to know the technician. That's, that's the key. That's why Jesus never healed the same way twice. That's so that we can't make a method out of what worked. Well, this worked, you know, that, the, I laid hands on this person, he was healed, so I could lay hands on everybody. No. Sometimes Jesus healed with the word, he spat in the mud, he spoke, he laid hands. The key is not the tech, that what is seen, but it's hearing from the Father case by case. Jesus did nothing except what he heard the Father's what he saw the Father do, and said nothing except what he heard the Father say. He was led by the Father, not by what worked. Though we need to, obviously we can learn by, live by principles, but here's, I want to come back to the three things. Living in thanksgiving, in praise, praying all the time, speaking as often as you can his word. Why? Now, as I said, the, the tr religious tradition is, if you can pray all day as your full-time ministry, 24 7 lock yourself in the prayer closet, go to the church, go up a prayer tower and pray all day, you are a strong, powerful Christian. You have really got God's heart. He really loves intercessors who pray all day. But guess what? Who's our senior intercessor? Jesus, right? He's an example of prayer intercession. Now, did he lock himself in the room all day 24 7? Was he the leader of prayer altars like we know today? No. So, obviously, what we think of praying without ceasing. It's not what we think it is, because Jesus didn't do it that way. See, pray without ceasing doesn't mean that's all you do, and forget about life. Some said, you know, some people are so heavenly minded, they have no earthly use. Okay, we are not called to be religious. Jesus was supernatural, not super religious. He was not super weird. He was so natural that very few believed the super. 
He looked like everybody, he acted like everybody, he didn't have a long beard down his feet, he didn't wear long hair down his waist, he wasn't dressed or act like John the Baptist. Okay? He was so natural, everyone doubted, what really? There's something super about him? He's just the son of Joseph and Mary. And so it's possible God wants us to be so naturally super. Super naturally super. And so, how did Jesus fulfill the command to pray without ceasing? Obviously it wasn't by not doing anything else. And I believe this is how he also lived in thanksgiving. You know, Psalm 45 says that Jesus was anointed with the oil of joy more than all his companions. We always love, I'm sure you have many people say, oh, he was a man of sorrows acquainted. Yes, he was. But what enabled him to go through that period of sorrow? Oh, he was the joy of the Lord. You know, sometimes joy is not the absence of sorrow, but the strength to go through sorrow. It's not either or. It's, a, it's, a, it's the oil that comes from his presence. Right, so how did Jesus demonstrate living in, in thanksgiving, living in praise, living in prayer, in the word, when he was so busy, right? He was always with people. Yes, he would wake up early, he would withdraw himself early in the morning, he would pray late at night. But for much of the day, he was surrounded with people. And yet he was praying without ceasing. He was always speaking the Father's word, what he heard he spoke. He was living in thanksgiving and praise. How did he do that? And really, this is the heart of, of, of the issue of how to abide in Christ, how to live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit. It's staying aware of His presence in you and upon you without being distracted by what your natural eyes see. And this is the key of we live, we walk by faith and not by. Because when what happens when you walk by sight, your soul becomes a slave, but your emotions become a slave to your circumstances. And there are too many Christians who live their lives slave to their circumstances. When things are going well, they have you think they're not going so well, they're not, they, they, are locked, they are depressed. Someone provokes them, they get angry. You know, it's like they're controlled by what's around them. They are thermometers rather than thermostats. And the difference is a thermometer reflects the surrounding. A thermostat sets the temperature. And you can only set the temperature when you learn how to abide in Him and not run to Him whenever you have a problem. You know, the more we learn how to abide in Him throughout each day, the less the devil can pull you out. You know, you need to come in when you're out. Stay in Him. Stay in Him. So, I'm gonna, the first key is thanksgiving and praise. You know, God does not need our praise because He's an insecure person who just thrives on us praising Him. Okay, He, he hasn't got any identity issues. He wants us to praise for our sake, not His. God being God, He has no need. He doesn't need us to do one thing for His sake. That's why He's called God. He's self-sufficient, He's all-sufficient. Whatever He tells us to do is for our sake, not for His. Right? You think He didn't know where Adam was when He asked Adam, where are you? Oh no, I can't find Adam, this man. I mean, he disappeared. Angels, help me hunt for Adam. <laughs> okay? He knew exactly where Adam was, but He wanted Adam to know that he was lost. Adam, where are you? Why are you not where you should be? Are you aware of that? Are you aware that you're no longer where? You always were where you should be. So when God asks us questions or wants us to do something, it's for our sake, not His. Right? So the power of praise. So why does He want us to always live throughout the day in an attitude of thanksgiving? See, it's, I believe it's a spirit. As I said, everything is a spirit. It's a spirit of gratitude. The attitude of gratitude. So godliness with contentment is great gain. And so much of this, our gratitude has to do with focus. As long as you keep distracted and looking at what others have and are doing and, and you don't know what God will call you to do, you'll never be satisfied. You know, when you don't know your assignment, you become jealous of other people's gifts. God gives each one different gifts and strengths for your specific assignment. And if you know what your assignment is, you will not want what somebody else has no matter how good it is. So you have to be secure that your gifting is according to your assignment from the Lord. So don't envy or be jealous of what somebody else that, oh, I wish you could sing like that or do that, be who they are. No, God hasn't called them to do what He's called you to do. He's given you a unique assignment. I like this picture where God wraps, He creates us around an assignment. He gives us unique strengths and abilities. He says the gifts and calling are without repentance. What does that mean? Each one is born with certain gifts. And, 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 and this really hit home because I asked someone, some of you may know Paul, Paul Ang, and I said, Pastor Paul, how did you start moving the prophetic? He said, 
I found myself being prophetic before I was saved. I said, what? Yeah, I said, in class you tell me, you know, I tell my students you're going to get this for your exam. How do you know? I just something tells me. <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> okay, you just knew stuff even before you were saved. See, the gifts and calling are calling even from the moment of conception. Why? God's heart is for His kingdom purpose. But guess what? If He's called you to be a prophet and you don't get saved, you become a soothsayer, a fortune teller, or a medium. If, if He's equipped you, equipped you with a voice, to usher in the presence of God through your worship, through your songs. You don't get saved, you become a secular artist, you become an entertainer, performer. And so, when we don't know our assignment, or you get saved and you don't know your assignment, you will abuse the gifting for your own standard of living, for your own popularity, for your own recognition. But everything God has given you is for an assignment, for kingdom purposes, for eternal value. And so that's why we have to know what God has called us to do. So that's the heart of being grateful. Don't desire what somebody else, unless it's for good, right? It's says, wow, I, I want to be patient again. I want to be long-suffering, that's so-and-so. Wow, they, they're, they're so forgiving. Emulate the qualities, the fruit of Christ. But nothing else, really. Not things, not, not favor, not, it, it's, God knows what we need. And that's the key to the presence of God. Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with... Uh, when you enter someone's gates, what happens when you enter the gates? Where are you? When you step inside, when you go through somebody's gates, you are now in their domain or dominion. Right? You are now in their, their boundaries. When you enter the gates of any embassy in KL, you are no longer on Malaysian territory. You are on that foreign soil. Though you are in Malaysia, when you step into an embassy, you are in the, you're in the ground of that nation. That's why many seek asylum by running into a foreign embassy, so that they can get refugee status or whatever. So as believers, we are called to be, we are in this world but not of this world. We are of another kingdom. And it's amazing how, how nations, how, how Malaysia, how the world is, is kind of monopolized by American culture through food and drink. Now you can count on your hands the number of food franchises that started in the US. Even drink. Somebody used to joke and say the two most popular words, no matter what language you speak, is Hallelujah and Coca-Cola. <laughs> you can be in the, in the back books in Africa and they will recognize those two words. <laughs> and it's like, whether it's, whether it's pizza or whether it's, it's whatever it is. Why? Culture is penetrated this land by food and drink. And that's why Jesus said, my kingdom is not meat and drink. It's righteousness, peace and joy. And that is marked by an attitude of gratitude. Why? Because the devil will want, because you see, when you're in his presence, so when you enter the, his gates, his gates with the exhibit, you're now in the king's domain. You're now in the kingdom on earth, kingdom of heaven on earth, your kingdom come. So how to abide in his kingdom on earth, stay in his kingdom, his domain of the king, through thanksgiving and praise. Which means you have to guard your focus. Because what you look at will determine your attitude. You know, as long as, as and, and I often say this, young kids, they love to, they're surrounded by people who have a lot more than they do and they often, are no longer thankful for what they have, and I always remind many times, majority of the children in this world have a lot less than you. Don't be distracted by the few who have more. Remember the majority who have less and be thankful for what you have. And same thing, that's why mission trips are great. You go to a country, a, a developing nation, and you have a greater gratitude when you come back home. Wow, thank you God, I don't have the challenges that many of the Christians there do. And you have a greater compassion for them. So God, your focus to God a thankful heart. And I believe this is one of the, one of the failures of, of Lucifer that led to his fall was he was no longer, longer thankful for what he had. He wanted what was not his to have. He wanted the position of God. He wanted the authority. He did not count it a privilege to give worship to God Almighty, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He wanted to receive worship. And so sometimes the danger of not being thankful is we entertain forbidden desire. And that's the root of usurping in some ordination. And it's like, I don't need you, I'm going to take a place. The absolute spirit. Because you'll always find something negative to criticize if you look hard enough. But I always tell this, in a perfect environment, Lucifer fell. In an incomparably less, incomparably less perfect environment, Jesus passed the test. Jesus passed the test under his own creation, under the leadership and authority of Joseph and Mary, whom he had part of the creating them in their mother's womb. They were born with sin, under the law, and he passed the test where Lucifer failed in heaven. And I believe the, the biggest lesson of that is 
More important than the surrounding is your response to your surrounding. You can be in a perfect environment and still fail the test. Because you see, there's no greater offense than the offense of truth. Even the disciples love Jesus. No fault of Jesus. That's why the word is a sword. It's like the sun that will melt wax and harden clay. So what happens is not the fault of the sun, but the substance. And so the Spirit of God will often offend the mind to reveal the heart. And many times when the Holy Spirit moves, many will take offense because it doesn't make sense. It just goes against green. I say, look, if the Spirit of God offends you or rubs you the wrong way, turn around. Right? You don't rub the cat the wrong way. Well, turn around so you rub the right way. Adjust and reposition yourself. Be aligned with the Holy Spirit. Say, God, I lay down. It doesn't make sense. I lay this down. I want you to fill me. And the key to His presence, like Jesus did, throughout every day of His life, I believe, He had a thankful heart. He woke up every day thanking God for who the Father was. Right? Perfect example in the boat, in the storm. There was Jesus asleep. Was He asleep because of His circumstances? No. He was asleep because He was in His Father's bosom. He was more aware of His Father's presence than of the stormy circumstances. And that gave Him the authority to speak peace to the storm. Thanksgiving and praise. Enter His gates. What else? When you begin to thank and praise, guess what? It's a, it's a weapon of warfare. Remember Jehoshaphat in Chronicles? 2 Chronicles 20, 20, the Lord said, Everyone praise me, and when they begin to praise the Lord in the midst of the enemies, guess what? God said ambushes. You see, praise is one of the most we powerful weapons of war. You know why? God takes care of the enemy while your focus is on him. All other forms of warf warfare, you're distracted by the enemy, what he's doing. When you praise, you're looking at the Lord and he takes care of the enemy. That's what happened when Paul and Silas begin to praise. They did not react to their circumstances. They did not get mad and, offend and offended with God for allowing them to be beaten up. They probably counted it in honor. And they begin to thank and sing hymns and praises in the prison. Their chains broke, prison doors open, and all the prisoners were saved. Yes, their praise became a sacrifice. And guess what happened? So when you begin to praise by faith, I like what I think Bill Johnson is. He says, he says don't rejoice because you have joy. You rejoice so that you'll get joy. You see, I mean, isn't that what being a believer means? If everything we do is driven by our feelings and our desires, that we're no longer believers. We are living by our feelings and desires. If you say you're a person of faith, living by faith, your obedience is not driven by what you feel like doing. And many times, sad to say, our feelings con contradict what we really need to do. We all love and desire greatly to eat and drink rubbish that's unhealthy for us. The sweeter, the saltier. Yes, I love that. But it's going to kill you if you don't if you eat too much. The things we need to uh, are not tasty vegetables or yuck. You know? Grains and wheat and beans and oh, all the stuff our body needs, not very tasty. Right. And so, but yet when the things, when, when it comes to the things of the Lord, we are so driven by what we feel like doing. Now I'm not going to sing. I don't feel like singing. Now I'm gonna, you know, I, don't, I want to be real. Yeah, aren't you called a believer? So, is that reality or is faith? What's reality? Is it acting out of faith or acting out of your feelings? And this is the key. When you begin to praise by faith, Isaiah 61 3 says. The anointing of the Lord will console those who mourn, giving them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. The answer for sorrow and mourning is the oil of joy. It's not circumstances, it's an oil. Or his presence. He anoints our head with oil at the table. The garment of praise or the spirit of heaviness. The answer to spirit. see heaviness is a spirit, it's not just an emotion. And the and, and, and the key to dealing with the spirit of heaviness is a spiritual garment. It's not pills. It's not just going to the beach. It's not a temporary physical band-aid. If you look at the, I don't know, Adventist Hospital still has a sign on its front entrance that says, God heals, we help. All doctors and medicines do is deal with the symptoms. It's like band-aid therapy. Only Jesus, the great physician, can deal with the root. Because at the end of the day, we just want our symptoms to be taken care of so it doesn't affect our quality of life. We don't really care if the root's there or not. You know, I just want to do what I want to do. But only Jesus can deal with the root. And so we got to realize that the key to sadness and sorrow is not just hyping yourself up, listening to happy music. It's the oil of joy. Put on the garment of praise. You got to put it on. 
right, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Psalm 22 verse 3, what happens when you praise Him? It says, you Lord are enthroned. You are holy, you are enthroned in the praises of Israel. He inhabits our praises. Isn't that amazing? You would think it makes more sense if it says He inhabits our prayers. Because most Christians think prayer is the most powerful, right? Prayer is not so important now. Have you wondered why there's so little on music in the New Testament? So little mention on instruments, unlike the old, unlike Psalms. I think the only time we hear of symbols is probably in Revelations in the New Testament. And I believe the shift from the old to the new is, is that the power of praise in the New Covenant, where we're all temples of the Holy Spirit, is your personal walk of thanksgiving and praise. See, so the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit came to a place, a physical location. They had to gather around the place and have loud worship. But now that the Holy Spirit is in each one of us, our praise is no longer dependent on coming together because God's only in these four walls. No. He inhabits your praise when you're all alone. In the prison, in your room, in the office. That attitude of praise invites His presence. Because now the shift is from corporate to personal walk. Yes, it's wonderful to come together and praise, but we don't live from that. We live from our daily walk. Alright, so that's the first thing. Stay in an attitude of gratitude. Rehearse your testimonies. That's how you walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, are led by the Spirit, you abide in Him. Remembering what He has done, say, Lord, I put on the garment of praise, the garment of salvation, anoint my head with the oil of joy, shift the atmosphere, I feel one kind. Be open. I, just, I wonder what the, the, the Western uh, version of one kind is. Is there an English, American version, Canadian, I don't know. I just feel one kind. Of. <laughs> If you're Asian, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, you don't know how to explain it. It's kind of a, very hard to explain. I don't know how to put it in, 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 in uh, You probably get what I'm saying. But out of sorts, yes. I kind of feel out of sorts. <laughs> right? that's, the, that's, that's probably the, the clearest thing. And so what we do in the natural, uh, I need to listen to the music or turn on the TV or go for a walk. And that's all temporary. But perhaps we can say, Lord, I put on the garment, please. I choose to offer sacrifice of praise. Second, and now, when you enter His presence, now when you're mindful of Him, now is the time your prayers are powerful and effective. That's why rejoicing precedes prayer, you know why? When you try to start just praying when you're feeling out of sorts and feeling one kind, you probably pray in frustration and fear and unbelief. Oh God, help, please help. So Lord, I come to you because I rehearse and remember what you have done. I know you're faithful. I know you're going to do it. See, the power of prayer is not in the words, but the spirit behind it. And to get the right spirit, you enter his presence with thanksgiving. So you can pray with the right spirit. Because unless, see, without faith, it is impossible to please God, no matter how long and hard you pray, it doesn't please God if it's an unbelief. You can even praise in unbelief. And that really is another aspect of the law. We think the law is just our circumcision or, or our thing. Sometimes the law is doing the right thing the wrong way. You do the right thing for the sake of doing it, as a ritual, as a tradition, as an obligation. But whatever you do, mix it with faith. And that's why we have to enter His presence. Don't pray outside the gates. Pray inside the gates of His presence. Pray when you can start to remember what the Lord has done. Remember your testimonies. Right? The spoken word. Because Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen are made of things which are things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Okay, so this is dealing with the spoken word, which is part of prayer, right? So you enter his gates with thanksgiving, the spirit of joy takes over, it displaces the heaviness, the depression, the depression from your environment, from your surrounding, from crazy people, like your job or whatever, right? Instead of rubbing over, you, 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 you impact them. Okay, so you get into his presence and you begin to speak the word. Frame. Because everything that you see begins in the invisible realm. Same thing with plants. Okay, a plant cannot grow unless it starts in the invisible realm with a seed beneath the ground. And so it takes faith to keep watering what you cannot see. There's no visible sign of change. You cannot see the period of growth before it pops up. By faith you trust one day it's going to rise up. And thank God for history, you know how long it should take for there's something not right. But with the Lord, you don't have no idea how long it takes for something to be visible. But stay faithful. Keep watering. Keep fertilizing. Because the things which were not, the things that are seen are not made of things which are 
You know what I mean? Let me say that again. The worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are seen. Visible. Therefore, Mark 11, 24, God says, Whatever things you ask when you pray, where? In His presence, from a heart of thanksgiving. Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them, and you will have them. And what's going to help you pray in that spirit of faith? Because you've just rehearsed His testimonies. You've recounted all the things He's done. And that testimony boosts your faith. Why? Because Romans 10, 10 says, But with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Belief, heart, and mouth. And now this is so important. Philippians 2, 12. Therefore, my beloved, Paul writing to the church in Philippi, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with... Now what does that mean? And I believe that the key to understanding that work out your salvation with fear and trembling is Romans 10.10. 10. With the mouth, with the heart we believe unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What's made unto salvation? Confession. So how do you work out your salvation? By working out your confession. Because life and death is in the power of the tongue. And that determines your thoughts because the helmet is the helmet of salvation. So your mind often affects your heart, comes out of your mouth. So when you enter the gate with thanksgiving, your faith increases. You're more aware of what you speak, because now you're mindful of the goodness of God. And keep speaking the word for God to act, because Jesus is called the high priest of our confession, not his own. See, the word con is really together with, C-O-N. Confess, speak together what is truth. And I'm going to close with this. One of the biggest weapons and lies of the enemy is to make you believe a temporary uh, effect is of equal value to truth. Let me explain that. When I, when I receive a thought, or I feel something, let's say in my body, I, I, I sense or feel something, that to me, is, initially it's like, I don't have peace. Why do I feel like there's something not right? Human nature will say, let me do some research and find out, could this be a symptom of something serious? That's temptation, right? But, but the Holy Spirit has taught me to, to, to respond differently. That okay, I feel this, whatever. Now I know this is not of the Lord because this is a fact, and facts are temporary, but the truth is eternal. So facts, if you like, are only true temporarily. Because they subject to change in a moment of time. Facts will become more aligned towards truth or less over time. So rather than receive something because it's true for a moment, reject it if you know it's not according to truth. You know, sometimes you can even experience lying symptoms. Just because you feel something, don't give it the value of truth. It's not the same platform of truth. It's a temporary fact. But the truth will prevail. The truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And say, Lord, I believe, so I will confess the opposite. Lord, I walk in your abundance of your life. It flows through every part of my body. I'm not going to receive this thought connected to this feeling. I reject it in Jesus' name. So don't receive something just because it's true for the moment in time. That's not the truth. It's nowhere near what the part of the truth is, which is life, life more abundantly. Begin to stand in the word, speak the word. Don't receive lies. Check your thoughts. Somebody said you can't stop birds from flying on your head, but you can prevent them from building a nest. So be careful on what you dwell upon. And this is where the warfare really is. In 2 Corinthians 10, it says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war or fight according to the flesh. But the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly or carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Where are the strongholds? Vain imaginations. Vain. No fruit. Unproductive. Unfruitful. Vain imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of truth of God. Here's the truth. So the warfare is between our years. So because the enemy knows if he can get your thinking, he's got you. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what does it mean to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ? It's like if you're on a warfare and you, and you capture a prisoner, 
You take a prisoner captive, guess what? Now you train the prisoner to fight for you. They're bringing a prisoner, a prison, a, 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 a weapon of the enemy captive to Christ to work for you instead of against you. And when you can rule your mind, that's why, and you don't, you don't, you don't learn that by information and knowledge alone. You say, Holy Spirit, change the way I think. I need the mind of Christ. How are you going to do that? Spend time throughout your day while you're working. Many times, as soon as I get up, I walk up and say, Thank you, Jesus, for sustaining me to the night. Thank you for another day. Thank you for the gift of rest. Committed to Him. Think of Him. But whatever you're doing, multitask. That's how you pray without ceasing. That's how you live in thanksgiving. You know, it's amazing. We can do everything else. We can, we're experts at multitasking except when it comes to the things of the kingdom. Right? We can do 101 things. Except we forget to live in thanksgiving. We forget to speak His word. It's a lot of struggling with this. I have the mind of Christ. And so when we learn to practice a grateful heart to verse his testimonies, so, we, so that when we enter his presence, we can pray with faith, so that we can speak, speak the word, call forth his word, just so that we are learning how to live in the spirit, to walk in the spirit, to be led by the spirit, so that we can abide in him. So now when things happen that would otherwise rob your peace and rob your joy, it's not so easy for that to happen, because you're in his presence. You know, the enemy is trying to pull you out through the gates. Stay in the gates of praise. Stay in the gates of thanksgiving. And that's how we establish His kingdom on earth. That's going to be a light in the darkness. Joy is a light to sadness and oppression. The spirit of the order, joy and gladness. Peace is a light to those who have no peace. The kingdom of God is a light to those who are not in His kingdom. And there are many believers who are, not, who are, who are saved, but they're not in His kingdom. They're not abiding in Him. And so it's possible to live a defeated, powerless Christian life, sad to say. And that's why discipleship is so important. To be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So I just wanted to share that this morning. And then next week we're going to look at the, at the anchor to why we do what we do. You know, when we come, when, when, when we come next week, I want to encourage you to this week, tomorrow morning, don't wake up, oh God, another day. All my emails, all my job, all my emails. You know, Jesus could have depressed he, 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 if he thought about the scribes and Pharisees and all that, you know, he may have wanted to stay home. <laughs> thank you, Lord. You know, he probably bounded out with joy another day. Thank you, Father. I get to glorify you. He wasn't distracted by what the, the, the religious nuts were saying. Okay, he, wasn't, he didn't lose his peace. Said, How dare you think about this about me? Don't you know who I am? He didn't have to defend himself. He didn't have to speak for himself. He was just busy doing what the, God, the Father called him to do. And so it's like, being dead to the flesh. And that's the last part of Galatians 5 we're going to close. And in the end of Galatians 5 says, verse 24. Galatians 5, 24. It says, Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We live in the Spirit and let us walk in the Spirit. And you know what? Can you imagine when we all do this? And here's the power. And we all learn how to practice the presence of God, learn how to abide in Him, to live in Him, walk in Him, be led by Him. We practice thanksgiving and pray. Guess what? Branches that are one in the mind will be one with each other. And you know what happens when we are one with each other in His sheepfold, in His sheep pen? That is where the Lord commands the blessing. And brethren dwell together in unity in Him. See, there's two forms of unity. There's a unity of branches when neither are in the vine, it's like the prodigal son and the elder brother had a form of unity before the prodigal left home. But the minute that the prodigal came home and got in the vine, that's when the strife came. So there is a form of unity when you're all united, neither, neither being in Christ. But the minute one decides, I'm going to be planted and rooted in Christ, I'm going to abide in Him, I'm going to walk, live and be led by the Spirit, and another doesn't, there's going to be problems. And so sometimes it's a surprise, but guess what? When we, as a household, dwell together in unity, what the Psalm 133 says, that is where how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. What's the foundation of unity? In Him. He commands the blessing of life. This is like the oil down the head of the priest. Aaron flows down his beard, down his, his, his garments, from the house to the mountains, like the dew on Mount Hermon. You know when that happened? The day of Pentecost. Who was gathered in the upper room? We're only told the specifics are only mentioned of 
the priests, the 12 disciples, and the family of Jesus. His brothers and mother were there. That's all. With the rest, we have no idea who the rest of the 120 were. But X1 gives that list. It's like to say, hey, that's, that's the priest of Psalm 33. And for 10 days, they were one accord, one place. And suddenly, what, what were they united by? A common expectation. So when we are united by a common vision, a common focus, a common expectation, God will reward your faith. He will fill the hungry. So come, so practice this this week. Let this be our, our daily assignment as it is mine. And whatever you do, don't be distracted so much that, especially let what the enemy means for evil, turn it around for good. And every time I'm tempted to complain, I look for the hidden blessing. And I've said this many times. And I'm tempted to complain about the jam, I complain, I, I thank God for the gift of the car, of air condition, of pasture. Oh, so many, so, so much a housework, I tell you. Thank God for, for a house that's big enough, there's a lot of work needed. I remember this one guy, he said, I don't complain about high taxes. I used to have to thank God for my great income. Because <laughs> if I wasn't earning much, I've got no tax to pay. That's boring. So he uses the high taxes as a blessing, that how blessing is to earn so much and to pay so much. So there's always a hidden blessing behind everything. You see, every blessing carries a responsibility. And so we are thankful for the blessing. We invite the presence of God. Let's stand together.